The term energy-based model means both everything and nothing at the same time. Almost any machine learning problem can be phrased as an energy-based model problem. And almost any energy-based model problem can be turned into a machine learning problem. What you're seeing here is an energy-based model that learns the concept of a shape from a demonstration on the left. So on the left, you can see a demonstration of data points sampled from a shape, in these cases, circles or squares, and then the corresponding energy function that the model infers from that. And then it can replicate that shape on the right using that energy function. Jan LeCun is a French-American computer scientist working primarily in the fields of machine learning, computer vision, and computational neuroscience. Lacoon was born in the suburbs of Gay Paris in 1960. He received his PhD in computer science in 1987, during which he proposed an early form of the backpropagation learning algorithm for neural networks. He was a postdoctoral research associate in Jeffrey Hinton's lab at the University of Toronto from 1987 to 88. These days, he's a professor at NYU and vice president and the chief scientist at Facebook. He's the founding father of a biologically inspired model of image recognition, convolutional neural networks, which led to the deep learning revolution, making the training of extremely deep networks tractable by truncating the receptive field. He was also the co-recipient of the 2018 Turing Award for his work in deep learning, together with Jeffrey Hinton and Yoshi Avenger. This gang of three are referred to by some as the godfathers of AI, or indeed the godfathers of deep learning. The International Conference on Learning Representations, ICLR, or iClear, is the number two international academic conference in machine learning, behind NeurIPS and in front of ICML. These conferences are ranked in terms of high-impact machine learning and artificial intelligence research. Lacoon presented a thought-provoking keynote speech, and today we're going to dissect it, surgically. But let me warn you, we'll be talking about energy-based models, which you might not have heard of. And we say the word manifold 145 times, even after heavy editing. So expect to learn more about energy-based models and manifolds in today's episode than you ever wanted to know about. So an energy function is basically just a function that is happy when you input something that looks like data and is not happy when you input something that doesn't look like data. This can be applied to almost anything you can think of. Uh, data can be correctly labeled images. Data can be images that look like natural images. The applications are endless and therefore also the topic is endless. Ultimately, the, what Jan LeCun does here is just reframing a bunch of things from different machine learning areas into the same framework. So energy-based models are not something new, it's just a different way of formulating already existing machine learning things. I thought this talk contained a lot of interesting ideas. Firstly, I'm excited to discuss the presented chart of concept acquisition in infants. Ever since studying the POET algorithm, I've been fascinated by curriculum learning or stepping stone tasks along the way to complex behavior. I'm excited to see what Tim and Yannick think of the perceived curriculum in infants, such as going from face tracking to object permanence and shape constancy. Jan LeCun presents three challenges that deep learning must solve. The first of which is learning with fewer labeled samples and or fewer trials. The answer to which may be self-supervised learning. We've seen an obvious example of this in papers like CURL or SimCLR, but another recent paper, Reinforcing Learning with Augmented Data, surpasses CURL with more data augmentation, rather than multitask self-supervised learning. I think there are a lot of branches of research at play with learning with fewer labeled samples. The most popular area which comes to mind is transfer learning, but additional fields like meta, multitask, curriculum, or continual learning will all have a part to play in this. The next two challenges Lacoon presents are learning to reason and learning to plan complex action sequences. This talk dives into the technical discussion of energy functions and how they construct the data manifold. Jan LeCun is talking about very specific types of application here, where basically you're learning uh, to trace out a data manifold by pushing points that are data down and pushing points that are not data up, thereby creating an energy landscape. 
Now, since this talk is pretty much about everything there could ever be, you'll see the three of us rather struggle with grasping what Jan Lecan is and isn't talking about. So we're trying to make sense of pretty much all of machine learning in one go. And uh, I had some trouble with this, but also lots of fun. It's a bit of a different talk for us because none of us are really experts at it, but we tried <laughs> and this is how it turned out. Have fun. Yeah. So the first thing you need to know are energy functions or energy-based models. What is an energy function? An energy function, sometimes called E, is simply a function with one or multiple inputs, let's call them X, and you can make the, if the energy function is happy with X, it will be the value zero. And if the energy function is not happy with X, it will be a high value, like larger than zero. So this is happy, this is not happy. So let's give some examples of this. We can formulate almost any machine learning problem in terms of an energy function. Let's say we have a classifier. The classifier is takes as an input image here, maybe of a cat, and a label. So if the label is cat, then the energy will be zero if the energy function is working correctly. <laughs> and if, but if we give the energy function the same image, but we give it a wrong label, dog, then it is very high. In the case of the classifier, of course, we can simply take the loss function as the energy function and we autom automatically get an energy-based model. So the loss function here would be something like the negative log probability of the, of the correct class. But in any case, it is just going to be a high number. Let's call it 10 to the 9. So the energy function says, ha, huh, this is very bad the entire thing you input. It won't tell you yet what's bad about it. So that also means you can change any of the two things to make the classifier happy. Now, usually we're concerned with changing the label, right? It's like, tell me which other label do I need to input to make you happy? And if we make the labels differentiable, of course, we never input the true label. We actually input like a distribution, a softmax distribution over labels, and that's differentiable, we can use gradient descent to update the dog label. We can use gradient descent to find a label that would make the energy function more happy. So we could use gradient descent to get the cat level if we had a, a good classifier. But we can also optimize the image to make it compatible with the dog label, right? That's things that if you ever saw Deep Dream or something like this, those models do exactly that. They optimize the input image for a particular label. And there you can vi view the entire neural network, including the loss function, as the energy function. So what's another example? <clears throat> another example is, let's say you have a k-means model and the energy function is simply input a data point. And for the data point, what you're going to do is you're going to find the min cluster index, the min k over, you know, you have your multiple clusters here and your data point might be here. So you're going to find the cluster that's closest and then the distance here, this distance d, will be the energy of that. So the model is very happy when your data point comes from one of the clusters, but your model is not happy when the data point is far away. And that would be the cost function of the k-means function. So that's an energy-based model too. Now currently energy-based models have come into fashion through things like GANs or any sort of noise contrastive estimation. So in a, in a GAN, what you have is you have a discriminator and the discriminator will basically learn a function to differentiate data from non-data. So that by itself is an energy function. So the discriminator will learn a function and that function will be low wherever the discriminator thinks there is a data, right? So it will usually do this around the data points. So the data points form the valleys right here. And then the generator will basically take that discriminator function and will try to infer points that are also in these valleys to produce points that are also in the valleys. 
And then you basically have an energy learning competition. The discriminator now tries to push down on the energy where the true data is and push up on the energy where the generated data is. And that will give you basically a steeper energy based function in the future. I hope so. In this case, the discriminator neural network is the energy function. And the degenerator just tries to produce data that is compatible with that energy function. So I hope that concept of what an energy function is clear. Any, any machine learning problem can be formulated in terms of an energy function. That last snippet with Yannick explaining energy-based models was taken from his personal YouTube channel. He's just dropped a video about an hour ago called Concept Learning with Energy-Based Models. And he covers the really cool paper from OpenAI. It was by Igor Mordach. It was, uh, it was a really good video. So thoroughly recommend you, you guys go and check that out as well. <laughs> Welcome back to Machine Learning Street Talk with my two compadres, Yannick Kilcher and Connor Shorten. <laughs> we had ICLR last week, iClear, and um, it's one of the top machine learning conferences. And what's interesting um, this time around is that it was completely open and on the internet. So you can freely go in and watch any of the talks and, and look at the papers. And there was a really, really good kind of keynote presentation from Yann LeCun and uh, Yoshia Bengio. So what, what did you guys think about it when you watched Jan's uh, keynote? And the first time I watched it, my head was like, oh, too much to the process. <laughs> and I had to like step away and think about it. But there's definitely a lot of interesting ideas in it, I think. Yeah, if you're not, I think if you're not familiar with what he's talking about, it just seems like a lot of information until you can and kind of distill it down to what he's actually saying. And then that it becomes more of, of kind of a what at first you think it's he's presenting something new but more and more you realize he's basically just describing what already is right in a in a sort of unified manner which i i find pretty cool yeah. i would agree with that when i first saw the presentation I, it was information overload and what i've always liked <laughs> about jan lacoon's presentations is he's one of these guys that likes to simplify things and make sweeping generalizations and um, he's the kind of guy that gives me deep intuitions about how deep learning works so at first this was out of character for him but having looked into energy-based models i mean let's just cut to the chase he, he spends the entire presentation talking about energy-based models and talking about lots of new things in the in the terms of energy-based models and i'll be completely honest i'll hold my hands up i've never heard of energy-based models before I, I feel embarrassed to say this. And when I Googled it, Jan LeCun had a wonderful paper, which was a tutorial on energy-based models, and he wrote it in about 2006. So, you know, getting on for 15 years ago. And everything in that tutorial was basically what he was saying here at iClear. So nothing has changed really in that time. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, like when I was studying GANs, I kind of hit a wall when I came to the Wasserstein GAN, because I, you know, at the time not being you know, introduced to this idea of like the smooth function that this kind of like scalar scoring enables. Like I had no idea why the Wasserstein GAN was, you know, why that was different. So I think this really helped me understand that a lot as well too. Interesting. I mean, another thing that really came up is uh, there's always been a tug of war between traditional probabilistic uh, approaches and the kind of deep learning approaches. There's a guy called Chris Bishop who wrote the PRML book, and he was a huge advocate of model-based machine learning. I once interviewed at Microsoft Research, and and they were pitching it hard. This was before the deep learning revolution, and th the way they described it was they always cite the uh, the no free lunch theorem and they say that every single problem needs its own machine learning algorithm and of course these type of models were almost created with the domain in in mind and they had these characteristic factor graphs where you had latent variables and you can kind of uh, model dependencies between the variables and you could do approximate inference in this probabilistic space. And Jan de Kuhn draws a kind of um, a corollary to that. But he says in his factor graphs, it's a mixture of deterministic and probabilistic functions. I, I would guess part of that developed into what today is the causality community, 
where they put explicit weight on, okay, we know how the data is generated, we know how the world works in some manner, and we let that basically determine our, our model, and then we learn the rest to it. I, I think it's a very valid approach, but it's not always one that you can necessarily achieve. It's, it's idealistic. One of the big things it sells you on in the abstract of a tutorial on energy-based learning is as probabilistic models must be properly normalized, which sometimes requires evaluating intractable integrals over the space of all possible variable configurations. So it seems like that sentence is contrasting saying probabilistic models is one thing and energy-based models is the other thing. And the key is that you don't have to normalize these energy-based models. So do you have any, like, so what does this mean to not normalize it? An energy-based model is any model where at the end you have a single number, right? The energy. And if the energy is low, that tells you whatever you put in, the model is happy with. And whatever you didn't put in, the model is not happy with. And you can interpret any probabilistic method as an energy-based method simply by having the the, the inverse probability as your energy, right? So if if you have a probabilistic model, then you know the exact probability that a given point is uh, occurring, let's say, in the world. So oh, okay. the, 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 the difference here with the energy-based model, you can only tell if something is better or worse. Whereas with a probabilistic model, you know exactly how good it is, how often something occurs in the entirety of the of the world or of whatever your your base manifold is right so maybe we can we can make a difference between if you take for example a language model and you give it a sentence and then the language model could tell you the probability that this sentence will occur in the english language is exactly 0.0000324 Whereas if this is an energy function, it could simply tell you, I am happier with this one than with this other one. I think there is a way, though, of transforming an energy function into a probability. And this is and, and this is one of the things that Jan talks about, how you compose probabilistic functions and, and deep learning functions. And the way he does it is by normalizing using this Gibbs distribution. So it's a bit of an arbitrary distribution, but it mean if if you normalize it over the integral, so over the domain of of your y's, you can turn any energy uh, function into a probability distribution. Yes, exactly. This this has been this has been the the main focus of many models, especially NLP models over the last years, is to have these normalizations and also previous methods like uh, I don't know, wherever these these graphic these graphic models mm -hmm. that were popular kind of at the advent of deep learning, conditional random fields, and so on. The, if you have a probabilistic method, you need to be able to compute this probability. And the com a probability is simply all the positive cases divided by all the possible cases, right? So if you have a language model, then your current sentence is your positive case. And you have to divide this by every sentence that is ever possible, right? So you have you have to basically ask your model, what do you think of that and that and that and that? And you have to do this for every single sentence in the English language. Actually, every single sentence that's even possible with any of the words in the English language. And then you have to divide by that. <laughs> so if you to get a probability, you need this normalization. And this is for many models, the main problem. How do you do this normalization? This is an intractable integral usually, and yeah. much, much work has gone into just approximating this. How do we, how, how can we factorize? So conditional random fields or things like this factorize this uh, integral into just single variables or two variable products. So you can compute this with some sort of uh, forward, backward graph message passing algorithms or other models like in NLP have normalized it by simply sampling, right? So instead of dividing by every single sentence in the English language, we just sample like 10. And we just say, okay, these 10 is your base distribution. So yeah, hmm. there's, there's a connection. I would say every probabilistic model is an energy-based model, and every energy-based model can be turned into a probabilistic model by normalizing.
future of machine learning and AI is self-supervised. One question I've been asking myself for many years is how do humans and animals learn? In particular, how do they learn so quickly, seemingly not requiring any supervision or very little and almost no interaction with the world? This is a chart put together by Michael Dupu that shows at what age babies learn basic concepts like object permanence, stability, and intuitive physics, inertia, gravity, and things like this. This seemingly is uh, being learned almost with no interaction with the world, mostly by observation. The, the young babies have very little ability to interact uh, directly with the world. And the mystery is, how does that happen? And how does it happen in uh, animals as well? This is probably the vehicle through which baby animals and humans learn massive amounts of background information about the world, such as intuitive physics and things of that type. Perhaps the accumulation of this knowledge forms the basis of common sense. I had to look up object permanence. So that means if a baby sees a building, it means the baby will know that the building is still in existence when the baby can no longer see it. <laughs> that is correct. That's well, why peekaboo works. <laughs> well, that's why this is a, that's why it's a fun game with babies because they to them it's like a miracle that you're still there once the hands come off <laughs> exactly so so what i what i what i thought when i heard this was something like i'm not sure here if the analogy is really a good one because basically what he's saying here is that it is through observation that the, the the babies learn these things, where I would strongly argue that there are millions of years of evolution where not only humans, but pretty much all animals had to have an intuitive sense of gravity, had to have a spatiality, had to have object permanence learned. So I would argue that it might much rather be a simply a module like in the brain that is innate that simply gets switched on at that particular yeah. phase during development rather than it is like babies come they the question is if if you had a baby in in zero gravity would it develop an intuitive understanding of gravity or not and i guess the corollary to that is what you should rather measure is things that could not have evolved like buoy maybe interacting with a computer or something like this? I don't know, what do you that, think of yeah. this? That's so true. I mean, it's very dangerous when we get into this anthropomorphization of uh, deep learning and just these dangerous comparisons with human development. I think the reason this fallacy exists is because when a baby is born, the baby appears to have no cognitive capabilities or intelligence whatsoever. They are all learned during the during the developmental period. But as you say, there are so many inductive priors in the brain already. I think what Jan's trying to say here is that the baby is not learning in a supervised way. I, I, I think the thrust of his message here is that the future of deep learning will be self-supervised and it, it won't be reinforced. Yeah, do you think there's anything to like the curriculum of how these tasks are learned? Like something we kicked off talking about Poet and how that has this automatic curriculum learning. Do you think there is anything to these sequence of things that are being discovered? Another thing that I think is interesting about the idea of this is them learning quickly, this is a demonstration of quick learning, is that in two months, you can actually get a lot of visual data in two months. If you assume that you get like 30 frames per second and then 60 seconds a minute, 1800, and even and you're looking at video data, which could be like variable length, I think you actually could get a lot of visual data in two months. Yeah, I think that's that's ex that's pretty much his point here is the fact that you do get all of this data, but you do not get the labels, right? You don't get any labels and also, mm. I think the why he takes babies as examples because they don't, as he says, they don't interact. So it's also not reinforcement learning. It's not supervised and it's not reinforcement. It's just something about consuming large amounts of unlabeled data that um, makes them learn things. And let's, I, I mean, I'm, I'm willing to go with the analogy here, even though I disagree on biology. <laughs> <laughs> Almost with no interaction with the world, mostly by observation. Uh, the, the young babies have very little ability to interact uh, directly with the world. And the mystery is, how does that happen? And how does it happen in animals as well? This is probably the vehicle through which 
baby animals and humans learn massive amounts of background information about the world, such as intuitive physics and things of that type. Perhaps the accumulation of this knowledge forms the basis of common sense. So being able to reproduce this type of learning in machines would be enormously, enormously powerful, would reduce the requirement for label samples and trials. And in my opinion, the next revolution in AI will not be supervised nor reinforced. So there are really kind of key challenges. I would argue that we've already had a revolution in AI, which is this self-supervised approach. It has transformed language processing over the last few years. Yeah, definitely. Especially like recently, it seems like these contrastive learning methods are just taken off as well. Absolutely. Although Jan makes some interesting comments later that he doesn't think they work as well for vision. But uh, deep learning AI and machine learning today, uh, one is, of course, diminishing the requirement for label samples and reinforcement uh, interactions. And in my opinion, that goes through self-supervised learning, as I just mentioned. Self-supervised learning really is learning dependencies between variables, learning to fill in the blanks learning to represent the world, learning to predict. The second one is learning to reason, going beyond system one, uh, Daniel Kahneman's system one, which is uh, not going through kind of a fixed uh, number of steps in a feed-forward neural net, but being able to sort of reason, perhaps by finding a configuration of uh, variables that satisfy a certain number of constraints or minimize some sort of energy or maximize some uh, likelihood. And the third one is uh, learning to plan complex action sequences. And I don't have much to say about this, unfortunately. Did you notice he dropped the energy word in there? So that was the uh, the first hint that we've got. <laughs> that this is going to be a talk about energy-based models. To me, it looks more like transfer learning from another thing. Yeah, I think, like I think it's self-supervised. I think it's both because um, self-supervised learning doesn't help with the sample efficiency problem. It just means that someone else does it for you. I think there's so many different areas of research that you can then pull apart and be like, it's transfer learning. Oh, and then you have all these tasks and now it's multitask learning, but don't forget any of those tasks. Now it's continual learning. And it's, you need a way of scheduling these tasks. Now it's curriculum learning. It's like there, if there are all these different areas that can relate to this idea, how exactly we're gonna use this self-supervised learning task to learn quicker and then meta learning also there's all these little things you can say that seem like their own subset of deep learning i don't understand this idea of learning to reason artificial intelligence systems in in general they are known as system one you know daniel kahneman in his book thinking fast and slow he talked about system one and system two and system one was the very kind of autonomous perception type tasks. System two would be the really deep thinking tasks that I couldn't do without consciously thinking about it. It's probably more in the reference to what a human does and doesn't do. I would describe the system one tasks as anything you would do with deep learning and the system two tasks as anything where you would actually write a computer program to do. And this is this is better explained in Joshua Benjo's talk in the same session, where he says basically system one tasks are intuitive. It's it's kind of subconscious and not not really conscious experience. Uh, system two tasks are ones that you can formulate with language, so you can reason it with language what you are doing. So system two things would be where you would have to apply logic in order to solve a task, whereas system one tasks would be where you can just learn to map input to output. It's quite difficult to wrestle with because in a sense, the deep learning models do reason. They are analogous to computer programs. Yeah, I think it's, it's very much a, a human concept, the system one and system two, because I think both Kahneman and Benjo, they also talk about how a system two task can become a system one task if you simply repeat it and it kind of becomes automated, right? You learn to drive a new road and you do it many times and then it just kind of becomes into your motor memory. I think it, this is really just a, a human concept concept and kind of a description of look of what he thinks these systems should be able to do in the future. Well, so is it learning to use logic can't be made into a differentiable loss function? Yeah, it can, but no one has done it very successfully so far. People say it's AI if we don't understand it. And maybe it's a bit like that. It's system two if we can't do it yet. In the hierarchical planning world, you would say something like, I need to get to the supermarket to buy food. And you would decompose that into, I need to get to the car 
I need to drive to the supermarket and I need to get out. And then you would decompose each of those again. You know, I, I need to get to the car, which means I need to grab my keys, walk to the car, open the door, sit in. And so in the planning world, that means the kind of hierarchical decomposition, the fact that what your system too does is it builds these big plans and then it breaks them down until the level where the system one can take over, like walk to the car. Yeah, I know how to do that. And the third one is uh, learning to plan complex action sequences. And I don't have much to say about this, unfortunately. So what is self-supervised learning? Self-supervised learning is learning to fill, the, fill in the blanks. Uh, let's take an example of a video. You, the, mach the machine pretends not to know a piece of that video and train itself to predict the piece that it pretends not to know from the piece that it knows. So for example, predicting the future from the past, uh, predict, predicting the top from the bottom, predicting missing frames, things like that or missing words in the text, as is, of course, uh, becoming very popular. In a nutshell, that is self-supervised learning. Just being able to uh, pretend you don't know things and, and predict either that thing or something in the vicinity or the top from the bottom. Well, he leaves himself quite a bit of wiggle room to formulate pretty much everything into that, because <laughs> now I can say, OK, uh, supervised labeling task is simply, I don't know part of the input, which is the label. K means clustering problem is simply, I don't know the cluster assignment. So I think the definition here is broad and is intentionally broad such that you can, you can formulate it later as energy based methods because it's all encompassing, right? I'm predicting missing frames, things like that, or missing words in the text. So the prediction must be multimodal. There's no single prediction that will be consistent with an initial segment of a video. Multiple future of the video are, are possible. So we cannot use just uh, a neural net that is basically a deterministic function symbolized by this sort of rounded shape blue block here, G of X, which makes a single point prediction. We have to replace this by something that can make multiple prediction. And one way to do this is to go through some an, an implicit function that basically measures the compatibility between the variable we observe X and the variable we need to predict Y. Now we're getting into the meat of it now. He's introducing energy-based models and straight away he's telling us about this new type of factor graph, which is a combination of the old school uh, probabilistic factor graph, but now with deterministic functions as well. And he's introducing this idea that um, we need to have multimodal predictions. So we need to have functions that can give us many, many predictions um, subject to an energy function. And this energy function of signals and labels needs to be optimized and smooth such that a such that the correct label on you know on or near the manifold has a low energy and any y's that are away from the manifold should have a high energy yeah definitely like it like thinking about gans and i think that's a big thing in like the style gan to model is how they put that st that random noise it just gets injected in the intermediate features and that helps it do you know more like is not like a deterministic generator where for every sampling of the z it produces the exact same face and you can do that by adding this sampled latent vector z into the forward pass so this uh function f of xy will take low values is if x and y are compatible with each other and higher value if y is incompatible with x if it's not a good continuation for the video, for example. The symbolism I'm using here is very similar to uh, factor graphs in uh, graphical models, except for this extra symbol of deterministic function. Now, I'm going to advocate to use energy-based models, which you know, basically measure the compatibility between X and Y through this energy function. Again, that takes low value if X and Y are compatible and higher value if, uh, if they're not. Uh, inference uh, is performed by, for a given X, finding Ys that minimize this energy. It could be multiple Ys. Uh, and this is a way of handling uncertainty without resorting to probabilities. So um, without resorting to probabilities. Yeah, so so the, the, again, the, the difference is here, you, you simply want a function that tells you when when it is happy with some input. And, uh, the, and that indicates by a lower number than when it is not happy. That would it be indicated by a higher number. And then he basically says inference. Now, if if I'm given an, ener an energy function, right, then I can, so if I have, let's say a video and I want to predict the next frame, 
and I am given an energy function, what I can do is simply I can find the frame that minimizes that energy function given my input. So that's 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 kind of a, a reformulation of what he's doing, though not all the models that he is going to talk about fit that particular criteria. Yeah, at first I, I thought that it was silly suggesting that there are possible multiple possible video frames that come next, but he might be talking about a computer game or something where if you interact with it differently, then the next frame will, will be different. But, but this is a very general framework, as you say. So he's saying, look at this energy surface and just minimize. So across all of those points, find the one which is the smallest and represent, use that as my predicted next frame. But even even if even for the video, I, I get what you mean. You mean that in the video that was recorded, there is only one next frame. Yeah. But if if you simply cut away the last part and just look at the sequence, you don't know whether the camera person is going to to gear left or right. So there are multiple in the in the true world, there are multiple continuations that are possible. And your energy function is supposed to capture that of course you're going to train it by giving it the samples but you hope that it is going to generalize in, into telling you there are all of these continuations that are possible in the real world and all of these other continuations that are just gibberish are not good so once y becomes like this high cardinality you know can take on tons of different y's to pair with our x how do we sample, like, how are we going to search for the Y's with our energy function? Yeah, and I, I think that that's where the Z comes into play. Well, and that, I think that is the, if, so he's, go, he's gone on to rephrase pretty much everything in machine learning in terms of an energy function. And I think the question of how do we do this exact thing is that that's the <laughs> that's what every model has ever attempted to do right so and and he's going to talk about specific ones but ultimately that is the the problem of the method itself if why is so high cardinality how are you going to do this it could be by training a generator right to to simply predict a y that has a low energy it could be by really optimizing with gradient descent to find the Y that has the lowest possible. It could be by a message passing method. It could be, you know, via many things. F is smooth in white space, can be done through uh, gradient-based optimization algorithms or some mm. other inference uh, methods. Uh, of course, his Y is discrete, it's much easier and we don't have to deal with that. I, I mean, he says if Y is, if y is continuous, we can find a good Y through gradient based optimization method. That's what we said, right? If we have an energy function, we can just minimize it using gradient descent. And then he says, if Y is discrete, of course, that's much easier. And <laughs> I am not sure because usually discrete optimization problems. Yeah. So on the one hand, if you think of a supervised classification problem, then you can phrase it like this. And then it's super easy. You just try every one of the classes and whichever one has the lowest energy, that means whichever one has the highest likelihood that you're going to output as the label. But in exactly something like a language model, it is extremely hard because you're going to have to try every single sentence that's possible and uh, take find the one with the lowest energy function. So I'm kind of confused by mm. what he said. But if y is discrete, does that imply that f, the energy function, f of x, y is uh, not smooth? Is a difficult question. These are like first year math questions. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not so sure it, it does imply that. It can't, it can't be, it cannot be. Well, it, it depends on how it is defined. If it is defined on the continuous space, but simply the set Y happens to be discrete, then it can be smooth. But if it is defined on the discrete set, then I'm pretty sure smoothness makes no sense. That's what I think too. If it's discrete, you're just jumping from point to point with no yeah. connection at all. Mm, but the function itself might be learning some kind of interpolation but it might not be smooth. Inference uh, methods, uh, of course, his way is discrete, it's much easier, and we don't have to deal with that.
There are conditional and, and unconditional versions of energy-based models. In conditional version, the variable X is the one that's always known, and Y is the one that needs to be predicted. In the unconditional version, the, the trick here is to train the machine to predict part of Y from, part, from other parts of Y, but we never know which one is known, which one is unknown. So this is sort of capturing the mutual dependencies between the, the variables as uh, symbolized by the, the drawing here on the, on the left, on the bottom left, that, that represents uh, energy function in this case here learned with k-means where the, the training samples are drawn on this little purple uh, curve. So I think in almost all machine learning use cases, it, it is a conditional EBM because we're learning a dependency between x's and y's. Yeah, I mean, he, he, he goes and immediately makes the connection to k means, right? And that's, again, we were saying before, this is going to ultimately encompass pretty much every all of machine learning. And here we see how it encompasses k means. So in k means, I, I simply want to create a function that is happy with any point in the data distribution by doing this, these means. But Ultimately, this is just learning the distribution of the data. But because I'm not normalizing in k-means, it is an energy-based method and not a probabilistic method. So here you can see the difference between energy-based and probabilistic. For a probabilistic method, this might be a Gaussian mixture model. But the Gaussian mixture models are usually much harder to globally normalize, even though it's Gaussian, so it's still pretty easy. Cool. So one way to handle multiple outputs is to is through the use of a latent variable. So uh, if we're going to build our machine out of uh, deterministic functions, the, the way to allow a machine to produce multiple outputs for a single input is to parameterize the set of outputs through a latent variable. So the typical architecture would look something like this. You have an X variable that goes through a predictor that extracts a representation of that X variable. And that representation together with a latent variable goes through a decoder, which produces the prediction. When you vary the latent variable over a set, it makes the prediction vary over uh, a set of, of a similar dimension. And, and the trick, of course, is to find, build a machine and train it in such a way that the latent variable represent independent explanatory factors of variation of the output. So he's saying, how can we take a deterministic model? This is kind of like um, variational uh, autoencoders, because imagine you have some data manifold and you want to design an architecture such that the latent variable can describe the domain of the manifold. Yeah, this is this is almost exactly a drawing of a variational autoencoder now. And uh, yeah, it, it's it's basically you you have this latent variable that controls how the output is made. So what you're producing is an entire manifold, which in some sense, again, is a very similar thing where you're learning just this mapping from the latent variable to the manifold. So that would be sort of not conditional on the X. So that might be a model before where it's just an F of Y. Interesting. And uh, so, he's saying that the information capacity of the latent variable needs to be minimized. Otherwise, all of the information would go into that. So the encoder takes the data and puts it into this vector. And then so how is the random variable added to that before it hits the decoder? So the random variable is sampled from the distribution that is described by the latent variable. Now, usually you can't back propagate through this, right? You can't back propagate through the operation of parameterizing a distribution and sampling from it. But with certain distributions, sampling from it is the same as, and this is where exactly this comes in. So what you technically do is you sample from a uni, like a one zero mean standard deviation of one Gaussian. And then you multiply by the standard deviation that comes in from the encoder and you add the mean that comes in from the encoder. And that operation you can back propagate through. So that is how you combine the latent um, variable, which is the sample from the Gaussian distribution, the standard Gaussian, with what the encoder gives you. Hmm. It's called yeah. the reparameterization trick. It was, it was very big when I started my PhD. 
<laughs> now, many energy-based models are actually uh, built using latent variables, and you can uh, reduce a uh, latent variable energy-based model to one that doesn't have one by either marginalizing or minimizing with respect to the latent variable. So uh, inference, of course, uh, takes place by minimizing the elementary energy function with respect to both y and z, the variable to be predicted, and the latent variable. But you can simply redefine the energy function f by minimizing the elementary energy function E with respect to Z, or by marginalizing, which is equivalent to computing some sort of free energy, as indicated here, the logarithm of the integral of exponential minus the energy where the integral takes place over the domain of Z. When you do have a latent variable EBM, if you want to formulate it just in terms of the X and the Y without the latent variable, you can either minimize with respect to the latent variable, or you can marginalize. And marginalize is where you kind of sum over the, you know, we were talking about the Gibbs distribution earlier, you know, over the domain of, of Z. So you're kind of summing over all of the possible combinations with the Z and then normalizing. Yeah, so so here, if a very simple example of this, that, okay, it doesn't fit the X and Y, but if we just had an F of Y, would be the, again, the distinction between K-means and a Gaussian mixture model. Both are clustering models, but one is just the, the, the hard assignment. So the top one would be an example for k-means, where your latent variable is the cluster that the data point comes from. So when you have a new data point and you ask your energy function, your k-means function, how happy are you with this data point? What it will do is it will find the closest cluster center and then the distance to that one cluster center is your, is the energy. That's how happy the model is with this particular data point. So it can only tell you that. But if you have a Gaussian mixture model and you have a new data point, you need to go through every single component of that mixture and ask them what probability density do you assign to that data point? And then you need to, to integrate across all of them in order to get an answer of what the whole model thinks of your data point. Exactly, so just, just to carry on from that. So this F that we see here, this is now showing us the, the entire manifold so it's kind of showing us how this is represented over all of the points of the the latent variable. So okay. what's the F sub infinity and F sub beta represent? The cost function of, in my example, the cost function of K means on top and the cost function of a, of a like a Gaussian mixture model on the bottom or the, the energy function in this case. It's integrating across them, right? It's, it's, it's going through each variable of Z and it's, it takes the energy of that particular Z and it tries to weigh it by, by that energy. So it, it is more like an integration uh, across all of the different Zs. It's like maybe you can interpret it as in a, in a game, in a, in a poker game. You want to, maybe you have a flush draw and you ask yourself, should I call this, should I call to in order to continue. What you want to do is you want to think of all the possible futures, which are all the possible latent variables. So the latent variable is which card comes next. So you want to integrate across all of that. And for each of these, you want to ask yourself, how happy am I with that particular outcome? Um, and and that would be your ener an appropriate energy function for that. Whereas if you play the game of uh, chess, then you don't need to, <laughs> come up with any particular move. You just want to know what's the best move my opponent plays and how is my move compared to that? So right, yeah, for each course. Y, you're going to find the minimum Z, which is the best move your opponent can play in response. And you want to find your best move according to that. The information capacity of this latent variable must be minimized or regularized. And this is a main issue that I will discuss uh, later. But this may turn out to be uh, impractical or intractable or only approximated through variational methods. Really? So an example of latent variable, let's say, or data manifold is an ellipse. What we, when we find a data point, we need to compute its energy by finding the point on the manifold that is closest to it so that we measure the distance to the manifold. And the latent variable would be the angle that leads to the point, the closest point on that manifold. Now, in this simple case, of course, you can write it explicitly, but in more complex cases, 
uh, of course, we need to find this manifold and the parentalization is non trivial. I thought this is really instructive, actually. Now, I, I like mm -hmm. the analogy um, that there is a data manifold because a lot of people probably don't even think of their pictures of dogs and so on as fitting on some kind of high dimensional manifold. But of, of course they do. And even though it's a contrived example, it's showing that your latent variable Z is actually an angle in, in this ellipse case. So the ellipse is the manifold and your latent variable is just something that you can use to push uh, your data point onto any position on this manifold. And if a new example comes along, its energy is simply a function of how close it is to the manifold. So if, it's, if it sits on the manifold, the energy is zero. And if the, if the, the new example sits away from the manifold, then the energy will be higher. Yeah, so the introduction of this latent variable is, is simply to be able to have more than one point that where the energy is zero. And 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 then each of these points will have a different latent variable assigned. And I, I do like the line the most that says energy is the distance to the ellipse, right? So your energy function is how far away is your point to the ellipse in this case. So the latent, so really though, it's not like an ellipse, is it? It's like this like squiggly line, you know, not something that's like the angle, you could just rotate it and keep hitting points, right? Wouldn't it be like a, like, you know, like a squiggly shaped circle? Well, the, it now, now it depends, right? Your, your true energy function is the ellipse in this case. Now, if you just have a sample of data points and you want to learn an energy function, what you're going to do is probably approximate that through some interpolation. And then you have a learned energy function. And then, yes, that would be like you do whatever your squiggly circle. It's true, but your, I guess what he what he wants to say, your true energy function here would be the the ellipse itself as a as a concept, as a manifold. And now, I think later he's going to talk about how do we learn energy functions and there is the contrastive methods and then there are the methods where you regularize things. And in this case, if I already know it's an ellipse, I could regularize my model to simply say you're only allowed to produce ellipses. And then if I'm given this set of data points, it would not turn out to be a squiggly circle. It would actually come to be pretty close to this ellipse for me this is kind of like i've been seeing this term data manifold like throughout my entire study of deep learning i feel like this picture is finally helping me understand what the heck a d data manifold is so it's like um <laughs> <laughs> it's like this path in this high dimensional space that is connecting the data to each other yeah manifold is just a fancy way of saying subspace but usually subspace is associated with it you know being linear or something like this but manifold can be whatever you want it can you can just it can just be well here's data and here's data and data is everywhere here or can be anywhere here yeah. it, it's a beautiful idea because manifolds come up all over the place if, if you for example do an l2 normalization on your vectors then they all exist on a manifold called the unit hypersphere because if you think about it, it's all the possible vectors that have a, a length of one. And there are many examples in machine learning where it's a fixed manifold. If you if you look at geo data, for example, um, the manifold is a sphere and CNNs work on the planar manifold. And actually, if you think about it, in some higher dimensional space, there exists a manifold that almost all data sits on. And, and many of the types of analysis and machine learning, even like TUSNI and UMAP, um, think about data in terms of the manifold that it sits on. Yeah, I guess, I guess, though, it just seems to me like in the high dimensional sense, it's so complicated that it, what's the point in thinking of it like that? Like if, if it's a unit hypersphere of say like L2 normalized parameter vectors that have like this massive dimensionality, I just don't get what the point is of thinking about it like this. Well, it's a very close connection to energy functions, actually, in that usually you assume your manifold is somewhat continuous and smooth, and the energy function is is one to one, basically your distance to that manifold. So it's it's it is incredibly general for the same reason that the energy function is incredibly general. It simply says the energy function is happy when the data is good and not when the data isn't. <laughs> 
I'm, I'm really interested to come up with examples of how this works on the kind of models that we get excited about, because this is a contrived manifold. When we talk about something like natural language processing and, and BERT, e even language fits on some higher dimension manifold. And I think it's quite instructive to think of examples that do and don't sit on that manifold and energies being pushed up around those examples as a way of learning. Yeah, I mean, it, it comes down to the fact that we probably will never be able to describe the manifold as manifold. But what we can do is we can build these energy functions that tell you basically how far you're away from the manifold. So if you can build an energy function like this, then at least you can hit the manifold with a reasonable probability by simply making the energy function happy. Cool. What would be the angle that leads to the point, the closest point on that manifold? Uh, now, in this simple case, of course, you can write it explicitly, but in more complex cases, uh, of course, we need to find this manifold and the parameterization is non trivial. Okay, so how do we train energy based models? What we need to do is make sure the energy for data samples is lower than the energy outside uh, of the data manifold. And there's two types of methods for this, contrastive methods that explicitly push down on the data points and push up on other points outside the data manifold or maybe on it, but less uh, strongly. And then there is regularized and architectural methods that essentially limit the volume of space uh, in, in white space that can take low energy and therefore kind of shrink wrap the uh, data manifold automatically without having to push up. There's some really interesting things here. So when we train this energy function F, we want it to be a lower energy for the given Y than all of the other Ys in the training set. So that seems to make sense. We want the function to be smooth so that we can use gradient-based methods. And then he talks about two classes of learning methods. And this is where it gets really interesting. He talks about contrastive methods and so-called regularized and architectural methods, by which he means things like PCA and uh, K-means and, and so on. And there's a real mission here, I think. He doesn't talk about traditional kind of supervised classification neural networks. Yeah, so, so first, it is actually even more, more general than that. You don't just want to make your point have a lower energy than every other point in your data set but then any other point, right? <laughs> it is just the difference between the different methods and that was going to talk about as well is how they come up with this, this contrastive uh, measure. So if you think of a GAN, the points that are pushed down are the points in the true data set and the points that are pushed up is everything the generator can come up with to try to fool the discriminator, right? Uh, so it's not even points in the data set uh, per se. And the, the other thing is, you can actually think of the traditional supervised learning in this way. If you So if X is your input and Y is your label, what are you doing? You're pushing up the label that is correct and you're pushing down all the other labels, all the logits, let's say, because you run this through a softmax uh, classifier. So immediately by pushing one label up, you push the others down. And there you have your energy, simply the the negative of that is your energy function for supervised learning. Yeah, so, so it's really interesting that we're using a kind of intellectual scaffold to talk about what's happening in a lot of machine learning algorithms. And as you say, the approach you just spoke about, energy is being pushed up and being pushed down. But Yang goes on to say that in this architectural method, it's a slightly different paradigm. That's when rather than pushing things up and down, you kind of shrink wrap the functional space around the manifold, so you, you don't need to push down. For data samples is lower than the energy outside uh, of the data manifold. And there's two types of methods for this, contrastive methods that explicitly push down on the data points and push up on other points. I'm not gonna read through all of this, but the big list of classical methods that can be interpreted in, the, in this context, either as contrastive methods or architectural method. The maximum likelihood, in, in distributions that are not easily normalized is actually uh, part of contrastive methods. 
and uh, which is what I'm, I'm going to talk about first. So there is an issue with probabilistic methods, which you can off. This is really interesting because we've been talking a lot about contrastive methods recently. We uh, had uh, the contrastive unsupervised representations for reinforcement learning uh, chap on uh, Srinivas the other week. And essentially that was talking about things like MoCo and SimCLR. And what those approaches do is they take these contrastive examples and they kind of push down on the positive positive pair and they push up on the positive negative pair and by doing so in the functional landscape you're kind of learning where the manifold of all of the images are so why do we want to limit the information capacity of that latent z vector so much well, I think that doesn't necessarily come into this. I think the Z is when you want to be able to generate new examples across the manifold. But I think in, in the case of these Siamese networks or the, the SIM CLR type algorithms, then there, there's no need for a latent variable. Well, it, I think the thing here is when you your energy function should not, let's say, depend explicitly on the latent variable. That means so if you're in your if you're in your poker game, your move should be independent of what the next card is really truly going to be. And if you're in a chess game, your the energy function is just determined by what move you're doing, because the Z is just going to be whatever is the minimum for the other player. I think it's just an expression to say that this it, the, the information shouldn't basically leak into your into this cost. Interesting. It talks about BERT as well, which is, I, th I think it's of huge interest to so many people at the moment. And uh, that is mapping points off the manifold to points which are on the manifold. And the points that are off the manifold are actually just uh, noised versions of ones that we know are on the manifold. So slightly pushing them off the manifold. It, it does raise questions about how far should they be pushed off the manifold? And if you push them too far, does that at some point become problematic? If the noise strength is too high, it, it's too high off the manifold, that kind of idea. Would it, because he gave the example of um, these mixture models actually being really bad because they want to have a manifold which is incre it's like a canyon and infinitely high in energy almost as soon as you get off the manifold. So I think that the general discussion here is that we need to have models that generalize better to previously unseen data and have smooth energy functions that describe the manifold um, in a way that represents any type of data that we could you know, reasonably expect to see in our data distribution. But just as we all know, because of the, the perils of deep learning, are that the models interpolate, they don't extrapolate. If, if you make a depression in the manifold, what you want is lots and lots of depressions in the manifold to form a canyon around your around where you want your manifold to be. But if the depressions are small and they don't form a nice canyon around your manifold, if the problem space is too sparse, then you're not really learning anything about your manifold. Well, I think that is that is the exact problem with any of these things. So in 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 supervised learning, on the one hand, you have the exact knowledge which things are there to push up and down. It's just whatever your ten classes or your thousand classes in ImageNet. But in let's say fully unsupervised learning, you have to consider every single possible data point there is. If you just want to learn a language model, as we said at the beginning, you have to consider every possible sequence of tokens there is and our models are just don't have the capacity to learn that so what we're trying to do is we're just trying to tell them look here is something that's slightly wrong please make it correct so it can what it can do is it can form that valley between the what's truly in the language and these corrupted inputs and we're just kind of hoping that that's enough Right? We, we don't consider anything outside of that. We don't consider any gibberish or anything. Yeah, as, as you said, how far is too far and how far is too close? Mm -hmm. So if we now start just replacing single words, that could even be a sentence that is in, that is actually correct. And, you know, so... Let's, let's push the BERT analogy just a little bit further. So we've learned this language manifold. And 
with a BERT model that takes in, let's say, 500 tokens, it's less than 500 because generally there's a separator token. But every single point on that manifold is a piece of valid language. So I think it comes back to this idea of stepping stones in curriculum learning in that we have these different manifold to like subsets of this high dimensional space that we're like giving it and we're like here try to understand this subset of this massive manifold or like entire space so you try to find a path that connects the manifolds that you're seeing to each other so maybe that's why like you do one pre-training task and then the next one and then the next one because it's easier to connect these manifolds in this like massive space yeah, I I agree. But because what you're what you're basically doing is with each pre-training task, you're finding a different way of defining points off and on the manifold, right? So if if you have the pre-training task of masking some of the tokens, the points that you find off the manifold are ones that are just missing some words. But then the other task is swapping some tokens. So that just gives you a different way of finding points off the manifold. Because what's not gonna work is as negative samples have, it, just imagine if your BERT input was just, you just sample 500 random tokens, and then you give that, and then you, you say, how well can you reconstruct this uh, training example right here? From this, <laughs> so that, that, is, that is too far off the manifold. How are you gonna do that? And <laughs> also, th this is an interesting point because now you have your training samples. So technically, what you should do is you should give the input and say, how well can you reconstruct any of the samples in my data set? Any. But since we took one and we masked out uh, words from this one, we can be pretty sure that the closest point on the manifold is actually that particular sample. But that's that's no longer the case if you go further off the manifold. You, you don't know anymore which of your training. So you, you're going to have a problem with training this thing because you don't know what to train it towards. You would have to train it towards every single thing in your data set. I'm also a bit confused with BERT because it has two objectives. And the first one I recognize as being the mast or the denoising uh, autoencoder because it's saying here is an input and I'm going to mask out some random words and then I want you to reconstruct it. That's one thing. And then the next thing is the next sentence prediction, which is completely different. That's not an autoencoder. So you're switching between those two tasks dynamically. And wouldn't those two tasks build a completely different manifold internally? Maybe it, the next sentence prediction task grabs all these intermediate tokens, and pushes them all up together in a way. I'm not sure. But maybe it's about forming, because you're like, I mean, I'm just thinking about it in like a three-dimensional space. Like there's this cube and there's substances of data in the cube. If I get to grab a whole bunch of points and move them together, maybe that helps than just moving individually. If that makes any sense. <laughs> yeah, I think I think, I think the, the analogy is pretty good because so again, what as an input, okay, our input space is now two consecutive sentences. Right. And we've yeah. already discussed that the masked language model will simply tell you which which of the two. So you can reconstruct these double sentences as one. But now you you have a different way of making points off the manifold, and that is to construct a non consecutive double sentence. Right. So it's it's just another way of constructing points that are off the manifold. So you're telling you're learning an energy function that says you should be very happy if two sentences follow each other, and you should be not happy if two sentences don't follow each other. So you're learning an energy function for those particular points off of the manifold, push those up and push the true double sentences down. And you hope, you hope that your model will learn something meaningful about language. <laughs> but don't don't you think that there is a divergence in the in the two tasks, or do you think absolutely? That they, yeah, yeah, that's so, that's the point, right? The point is with every additional task you introduce, the point is to find more ways to find points off of the manifold. But in which case, do you think that one task makes the other one work better, or do you think that they help each other work well? <laughs> 
Yeah, they they do feature sharing. That's the ultimate goal is that the, that that features are shared. That there is something about language features that will help both tasks. And by doing gradient descent on both tasks equally, uh, these features might develop better. And then the same features will transfer to other tasks that you then fine tune on. Uh, which is what I'm I'm going to talk about first. So there is an issue with probabilistic methods, which you can, of, of course, almost always turn an energy function into a probability distribution using a Gibbs distribution, and you can do maximum likelihood. But you basically have to do maximum likelihood if you want estimates of densities. The problem is that estimating densities is not necessarily a good idea, because uh, by doing maximum likelihood, what the system wants to do is give the lowest possible energy to data points and the highest possible energy to, point, to points just outside of the data manifold, which leads the system to create to creating extremely deep narrow canyons, and those are not uh, particularly useful for inference. We need smooth functions, so those functions would need to be regularized, for example, by a prior or another regularizer. So the, my first question is: even though I see the canyon, but it looks smooth to me. I think he <laughs> wants to demonstrate with these super steep walls. Uh, but, but, but I, I get what he's saying, but it, it seems to be just, you know, a property of that of that temperature parameter, how smooth and how steep these things are really going to turn out to be. I think the the main problem with these things is that, again, yeah, you have to globally normalize, which means that every single point in your input space must be assigned some non-zero probability and that. Good luck. Because he says on the last bullet point, but then why use a probabilistic model? So I think clearly Jan LeCun is not in the probabilistic models camp. Yeah, probably not. <laughs> yeah. Is that just because you don't want to have to sum over all those all the terms on the bottom, though? If you're if you have this probability distribution and you're, you know, trying to assign a bunch of probability to one and the others in that kind of way, it causes this extra like deep valley, I guess. Yeah, I guess what usually happens is it just it will just when your data point is here, it will just try to assign as much probability mass to that point, and that will automatically take away mass from other places, including things around that data point. So what you're, if you don't regularize properly, you're just going to end up with like a, a Dirac distribution everywhere on your data points and nothing in between. <laughs> but again, it's, I think it depends on this temperature thing. So. But then we lose the advantage of actually estimating densities when not estimating densities anymore. So why not throw away the probabilistic framework altogether and just learn dependencies through an energy function? So throwing away the, the probabilistic framework sort of allows us to use more freedom in sort of deciding on what objective function to use. The characteristic of the objective function is that it must be a, an increasing function of the energy of data points and a decreasing function of the energy of points outside the data manifold and perhaps through some sort of margin that depends on those two points. So he's saying, let's throw away the probabilistic framework. And now he's introducing the kind of loss functions that we see across the machine learning world. So things like hinge loss and presumably just things like squared loss would be in there. And he, what he's saying is quite intuitive, that it should be that if the example falls away from the data manifold, then it should have a higher energy. Yeah. True. But can we just like backtrack and just like be very clear about this is in comparison to probabilistic methods. What would a, where exactly is the difference? Is it just this idea of not summing over all of the possible whys? Is that the key distinction? Yeah, the, the fact is here you lose the ability to to make a, a numerical prediction about how likely a data point is. You simply you simply compare it to others. That's all you can do now. Hmm. Does this get to the to the nub of frequentist versus Bayesian? It, is it is it about the the Bayesian approach has this notion of seeing things in the context of all of the possible things that could occur. Therefore, you can reason about confidence and and its likelihood, etc. I'm not sure. I think a frequentist would still normalize their distributions, but it it could maybe be compared. Uh, to that, in that a probabilistic model will always put it in relation to the global space of, of inputs. 
Whereas and energy functions just give you the number. Several forms for those energies. I'm not going to go through the details, but they've been used in various contexts over the over the years, either for things like Siamese networks or metric learning, or for ranking or uh, or or embedding. And then more recently, there's been uh, objective functions that use not just a pair of points, but uh, yeah. a whole set. So obviously, there's very successful applications of self-supervised learning today, in particular in the context of natural language processing. Everybody knows about BERT, which was preceded by the colbert weston set of techniques, which used a form of denoising autoencoder where you take an input, you corrupt it, and then you train the system to distinguish between the clean version and the corrupted version. In denoising autoencoder, you train the system to map corrupted version to clean versions. Therefore, now the reconstruction error for corrupted points is the distance between the corrupted point and this clean version. And so you have automatically an energy surface that grows with the distance to the manifold as represented here on the bottom uh, right. This represents the vector field of the, basically the gradient field of the energy function produced by denoising autoencoder. So this is really interesting. I think as we were saying before, we haven't really visualized something like BERT. Of course, this isn't the manifold for BERT. This this is just a, a simple manifold, but it does show exactly what's happening here with this denoising autoencoder. We're just finding examples that are off the manifold and comparing to ones that are on the manifold. It would be so funny if it actually is the manifold of BERT. <laughs> like if, if some mathematician in the future proves that human language is a spiral, it just would be like, Jan Lacan would be treated as a god for predicting. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just just imagining things here. Yeah, I'll, yeah. Ultimately, it's exactly that, right? So you want to find some method of throwing points off the manifold and then mapping them back on automatically gives you this energy function. And the more ways you find of knocking points off the manifold, the better your energy function is going to be. And it, it might be just be worth talking about this diagram again. So he's using the visual concept from the beginning of the presentation, which is the self-supervision. So the the X is kind of disjointed in this space and it goes into a deterministic predictor decoder. What's this uh, C? Is This is in a red square. That's a loss. The, in in the, in this case, it's the so it, it takes the Y hat, which is or tilde. I can see it from here. It is. It takes the Y that Bert predicts, right? Bert says, here is what I think the sentence was before you took out all the tokens. And it compares it to the actual sentence before you took out all the tokens. And then it just applies, in Bert's case, it applies a classification loss on each token. I see. So, so if, if the decoder has um, predicted something on the manifold, then it will push the energy down. Well, if the decoder has predicted that exact thing on the manifold, then the loss will be zero, right? And you're you're learning, in this case, you're learning your predictor and decoder function to make the energy low. Yeah, so so you can see the two inputs. So it says this is a duh, 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 of text extracted, duh, duh, duh. so this is, this has been corrupted and and then we want the predictor and the decoder to predict the non-corrupted version. And if the comparator finds them as being the same, it will push down the energy on the internal representation at that point in the manifold. Yes. So it's like we inject this prior of like, here's how you can throw points off the manifold. And then... I guess like what's really bothering me with thinking about this is how it is mapped into this manifold because you're training the features as you're simultaneously like talking about pushing it off this manifold. So it's learning this manifold as it's being told what's on or off of it. it transforms so much throughout the training, right? There are multiple <laughs> manifolds going on here, right? I think in this case, in the bird case, it, we're just thinking about the manifold of natural language of in specifically double sentences, but just the manifold of natural language. And we're throwing it off, we're throwing something off the manifold by simply corrupting it. And then we're learning this decoder function to map it back onto the manifold. And the, the, the energy function measures the distance mm -hmm. to the manifold, right? And in this case, 
we don't have to learn this energy function because that's a given. The energy function is the loss between the y and the y hat. But we're now learning this decoder and predictor model in order to minimize that energy function. So it's, as I said at the beginning, it's not always that you learn the energy function per se. You learn that distance, but sometimes you actually learn the thing that minimizes the distance. It's interesting to think of uh, these algorithms are representation learning algorithms, but they are also manifold learning algorithms by extension. And most of the time we are not constraining the type of manifold that could be learned. What we're constraining here is the way we throw things off the manifold. That is, that is, and, and we, we're doing that because if we wouldn't constrain that, we had, would have no idea of what was on the manifold. Because <laughs> the only reason we can train anything here is because we know this is the data sample that is on the manifold and that is closest to the Y, the, to the corrupted one. But would it, is it relevant that the, the manifold that it's learning is changing during training? Well, yeah, it depends on which manifold you know. <laughs> well, it, is that the case? Is is it that when when the BERT model converges, there is a manifold? But no, there, does that there manifold, manifold change? There is a manifold. The manifold of natural language never changes, right? That is just the manifold of natural language. And we have data points on this manifold given in our training set. And all we're doing is we know that these points are on the manifold and all we can do is we're throwing them off a bit. We, we don't actually know, but we think we're throwing them off. We're pretty sure because we mask out these words and that should give you something that's not on the manifold and then we're learning to map them back. But on that point, I agree with you, there may well be some notional manifold which perfectly represents the English language. But we could, every single layer in a neural network transforms one manifold into another, and we could quite easily transform language into a spherical manifold, just to, just doing an L2 normalization. So then all of the inputs to BERT would exist on, on the sphere. So I guess what I'm saying to you is that there are many possible manifolds that language could exist on. And, and given a typical neural network for BERT, does the manifold change and evolve during training? I think it does. The one that it that the bird represents for sure, yeah. Yeah. Is it also worth thinking that it's like shrinking the dimensionality of the manifold as it goes through the network too a little bit? And so maybe like throwing it off the manifold is trying to tell it as we compress it, keep them overlapping in some way? That is, that's a good question. Is the, the, the things that BERT can produce at the beginning, is that space somehow higher dimensional or is it just different, right? It is a, it is a really good question. So if this is the manifold of language that it's supposed to learn, at the beginning, is it learning to output every possible thing or is it just out learning to output something else and, and we're just kind of doing that? That is a, I have no idea. Um, <laughs> who knows? So is that what we think then that like, so we have this manifold of all natural language and let's say it goes into a three dimensional representation so we can think about it. So if we have this cube of all possible data and our manifold describes some like oddly shaped circle in this cube. So is it like, would we imagine that originally, you know, this like our coverage of this cube could be like this oddly shaped thing that's very sparse and not dense or something? How do you think the manifold in now this cube changes during training? Would it be more clustered or would it cover more of the cube? Well, I so so yeah, here here's the question. So we have to rephrase it maybe a bit. Let's say your true data distribution is like a a weird circle in the in the cube and you build a neural network that can basically output any point in the cube initially and now you you train it and you're bas you're asking okay how does the things that it outputs how does the things where it thinks the energy is low changes as the training progresses and that probably is very much a function of a 
how you find ways to throw things to to basically train it in and B, what the architecture is. And this is exactly where Jan LeCun differentiates the two methods. So in the contrastive method, what you would do is you would say, I have a bunch of samples from this weird circle. I don't know yet anything about the weird circle, but I have a bunch of samples and I'm just going to try to move them in each direction and learn a function that is high there and low where the actual points are. So what you would end up with is kind of like a tube where, where, <laughs> right? Like, like a, a hose where it, the inside of the hose has a very low energy function and the outside has a very high and you don't know anything about the rest of the cube, but you don't need to maybe because, be, because you only deal with points that are sort of close to that. And the other way to uh, do this is by regularizing by basically a priori saying, look model, you cannot actually output the whole cube. You can only output circle-ish things. And now please fit yourself to that thing. So these are the two methods and we can contrast it to a probabilistic method. The probabilistic method would need to assign a probability to every single point in the cube right? and need to consider the whole cube. Whereas we just need to consider that area around this circle. That's maybe a better way of phrasing. <laughs> it's interesting. As an aside, when I read Francois Chalet's Deep Learning book, he used this wonderful analogy that deep learning is a little bit like, imagine you have a piece of paper that's been scrunched up into a ball and every single layer successively unscrunches the piece the piece of paper until until it's beautifully flat at the end and it, it does make me think that because of the way that the architectures are described in, in deep learning it, it might actually be expedient for it to create a, a kind of manifold which suits our task or suits our purposes at, at the end ultimately if you unfold all of this through your neural network and then you make a linear cut which is what the supervised methods we have nowadays do they just or a linear classifier at the end. The data manifold, so to say, is when you trace that cut backwards through all the layers, through this folding and look at it in the input space. That's that's basically what your neural network learns is whatever that cut's gonna end up being in the input space. It, it, exactly, it's a, and that's a beautiful example because imagine if uh, you're on your A4 piece of paper, you had a vertical line and you you colored half of it red and half of it black, and then you scrunched it back up again into a ball. It would be very difficult to make that cut when it's scrunched up into a ball. But if you first flattened it out and then made the cut, then it would be easy. Yeah. So this has been incredibly successful in the context of NLP. The problem is it doesn't quite uh, work in the context of images, and, and there's been sort of a lot of work in trying to sort of use self supervised learning to learn good features in images. And it's only in recent years that those systems have been, uh, those attempts have been somewhat successful at actually giving good features. They're based on uh, what's called contrastive embedding or Siamese networks. The idea is you show uh, a system an image X, and the image uh, Y that would be compatible to it would be a distortion of that image that doesn't basically change its content. And you train the networks to produce similar outputs, similar vectors, or perhaps even identical outputs. And then the contrastive, the contrastive samples consist of, of showing two images that are, are different and then pushing the two vectors uh, apart. There's been successful applications of this to face recognition, but Tagman et at all many years ago, but and, and earlier examples of Siamese Net for various applications. More recently, though, the techniques Perl by, by Ishan Misra Moko by Kaming Hun, his collaborators, and SimClear by the team uh, from Google have shown that you can learn uh, good visual features using those techniques. And so I think DeepFace was the first paper that I was aware of that did something like this. It used the Siamese network architecture. It's similar, it was, it's different to the kind of the, the Sim CLRs and the Mocos of this world, because what they do is they don't need any labels at all. They just generate perturbations of, of the image. And then the classification task is to say whether or not they are the same image. Whereas the deep face and the, the triplet variant of it, which was called FaceNet, the classification task, you, you already knew the, the identities of the people in the image. So you would say, is this the same person or not? And the, the challenge is this negative mining strategy because 
you know all of the points on the manifold, but you want to come up with examples, contrastive examples of things that are different. And if you think about it, there are just too many possible combinations. The, the reason the triplet loss came about was trying to make the algorithm converge faster by selecting hard examples. So you'd have a, an anchor and a positive and an anchor and a negative, and you would try and make the anchor and the positive as um, dissimilar as possible. I wanted to correct myself from before, where I said you don't always learn the energy function. You can maybe here see the same thing, right? The, the, the thing on the top is simply the loss. It's simply a, maybe a distance function between these two encoded things. But you can always make these encoders part of your energy function. So your energy function would actually become all of the blue and red stuff together. And that's how you basically reformulate. You can reformulate everything into the energy function that you're learning. But it's it's uh, the thing that you're learning is not always outputting a scalar, if if you will. <laughs> but why do you why oh, do yes. you think why do you think that these methods like the BERT method works not so well for let's say images? What what he's saying here? Well, I think it's the no pixel level reconstruction, right? If you were to do BERT and just like crop out or put random pixels in, it yeah. would have to like the output would have to be this gigantic image, I guess. Yeah. But but you can you can do that, right? You you could technically just mask the pixels and then ask it to reconstruct, and that's how autoencoders mm -hmm. work, and and they're just not as good. So is it something about the visual domain or is it something about the fact that there are just more pixels or what do you i think there are more ways that an image can be semantically equivalent but completely different just things like camera angles and distortions and lighting and resolution i mean even the dog can be rotated or different colors and so on and it's still a dog there are just more ways that you can diverge in the visual world but still be semantically equivalent I can say there are an infinite number of ways I can express the same thing in natural language. Are there just infinitely more infinite ways in the visual domain? Could you um, linger on that a little bit more? Why are there more ways of uh, semantic equivalence in language? That That is my, my question. Are there? I mean, the, the, I, 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 think can, I can express the same thing in, in so many different ways, but maybe it's just not as many as I could express the same picture in in different pixels. But I think like the way you already give it some context in the sentence before you apply the mask constrains it so much that, you know, the way you would give it context in an image and then mask out the section of the image is way less constrained than the than the sentence. I think at least it's like mm. my guess at that. If you just look at it in terms of the dimensionality, the image will have three color channels, it will have a resolution, it will have many layers of processing in, in the encoder. The, the language is already pre-processed. I think when we create these word piece embeddings, we do things to reduce the specificity of the tokens and re reduce the vocabulary size. And it just seems to me that there are the, the, the space of perturbations is smaller. Maybe, yeah, that's true. I, I think the visual domain makes it very explicit that the true task in these contrastive methods is to find good ways of throwing the of throwing the data points off the manifold. Because what ultimately ended up working is things like this uh, cropping and, and augmentations and things like this. Indeed. And maybe another way of, of, of um, describing it is with language, it, it is structured. Even in the Transformers model, you still have connections to actual tokens which have um, semantic meaning. In the visual world, it's just pixels. You, that There is no uh, structured connection to the thing that you're trying to learn at all. I, I just think it's an interesting thing to think about. It could be something about, yeah, that the dimensionality, how structured it is, 
the fact that there are just so many more pixels than there are words. Well, okay, what, what do you think about this? Let's say we have an image encoder that brings our images into this three-dimensional space, and then we're, we put our entire data set through it, and then we plot it in this cube where, it curr- where the neural network has currently put it. So then do you think these different data augmentations, like we talked about, so with the reinforcement learning with augmented data, paper they show that like cropping works really well as a data augmentation so yeah. do you think that when you cr- take the crops and then push, put them through the same encoder that had just encoded the original data space that the distance between the original data and the cropped image is closer in this new like manifold subset than say rotating all the images that's a good question probably yes right because you're what you're telling the, the the model is that the cropped version and the original version is the same so it should map it should map them closer yeah i guess like what i'm trying to get at is like so is the key to designing a good augmentation for contrastive learning to just throw it off a little bit you know the current thing like don't throw it off too far because then I now there's like no overlap and I can't recover this. Like we I, talked about with scrambling the pixels, you could never reconstruct it if it was just like scrambled anywhere. Yeah, I, I think it depends a little bit on the kind of inductive prior in the encoder architecture. So if it uses a CNN, that has a translational equivariance. I say that in air quotes, I don't think they actually are equivariant, but so that means it would work rather well for chops it would learn that if this particular square and this particular square is in the same image. But if you started doing things like uh, rotations mm. and scale transformations, then it would struggle to um, even recognize those two things as being the same. However, uh, the cost, the computational cost of these methods is very high because there's many ways to be different, for two images to be different. And for this to succeed, the amount of computation and training is absolutely enormous, even for relatively small data sets. So I think ultimately those methods actually are not the best and won't won't scale to really very, very large uh, representation vectors. You can interpret GANs also as contrastive methods, basically where the the data points are are pushed down, particularly the the sort of energy-based formulation of GANs, energy-based GANs where you push down on the energy of data points and then you push up on the energy of chosen points and those points are generated by the generator network that is trained to produce points that progressively get closer to the manifold so as to shape the energy function. Now, GANs can use any kind of uh, objective function as long as, again, it's a decreasing function of the data points and an increasing function of the generated points. Yeah, that's an interesting, that's an interesting point, the fact that not only in GANs, not only is it one way of throwing something off the data manifold, finding points that are not on the data manifold, but it is true they do get progressively closer. So it's a kind of built-in curriculum learning, right? Because the generator at the beginning can produce pretty much any point, but the points it produces will get closer and closer to the data manifold. And Mm. it's like a built-in curriculum for the discriminator. That's interesting. And and so the, the generator manifold will kind of converge on the discriminator manifold. Yeah. And do the manifold, because they're, they're different architectures. I mean, I think there is a little bit of cheating, right? The, the generator is allowed to peek at the weights of the discriminator, but to, is the final manifold the same, regardless of the fact that one's a discriminator and one's a generator? Well, you would, you would hope you would hope it is the same in the fact that, so if you look at the, at the generator, it produces data, right? So it has, in fact, a much harder job because you can, you can look at the same manifold in data space through the eyes of the discriminator by simply viewing it as an energy function. And now you say, whatever the discriminator tells me is low energy, that's where data is. And that's exactly what the generator does. It tries to go wherever the discriminator uh, says, here's low energy. But the discriminator, you know, is also trained on true data. It must also say that true data has low energy. So, and that's why the the generator manifold ultimately matches up with the data manifold, which is what we're interested in. 
we're, we're interested in describing the data. But the interesting thing, though, and, and this gets to my point from earlier, is that if you look at the the functional landscape of the discriminator, it, so let, let's say this this thing that we're looking at here, what if it's completely flat? So it, it gets orange at the top. Then what if it's completely flat? So what if the generator produces a green point here? How does it know to descend down into this valley? What if there is no gradient? I think these green dots are what the generator produces and the valley is where the discriminator is at. So this is where we want the manifold to be. So, but, oh. but I think it, it needs to know this gradient in order to produce better examples on subsequent uh, iterations. Yeah, it does, right? You backprop through the discriminator to the generator. So the generator always knows in which way it needs to change to, in order to fool the discriminator more. GANs are notoriously difficult uh, to train and to, to train stably exactly because of that. So if you take a super advanced discriminator that can perfectly tell you, here's data and here it is not, right? There's like this super steep cliff and then everywhere else is just bad. All, all of the rest of the data space is just bad. That's bad. And you get no gradient. So. If you want to learn a generator in that landscape, you have no chance. As you say, you have basically have no gradient. So what you need to do is to train them jointly so that you always keep it flat enough for the generator to come closer. But then it's kind of too, right? It's, it's too easy. And then the discriminator can, will make it steeper and then you get gradient. Again. So it's, yeah. Very cool. But I think so, that this energy uh, paradigm is a great way to think about it. Definitely, yeah. I mean, this is a variation. This talk is a variation on the talk that Lacan has given about GANs a while back. He had he had this talk where he basically says GANs are the biggest idea in machine learning since, I don't know, in this, in this decade. And he talked about much of the same thing about these energy functions, just not as general as he's talking about them now. Do we still need GANs to produce really good generative models? <laughs> that is a very good, that is an extremely good question. Of course, in, in the framework of energy-based models, the generator is sort of a byproduct, right? The generator is sort of the way that we produce points that are off the data manifold. Because what we're assuming is basically the space of images is so high dimensional that this model is never going to hit it perfectly. But if it hits it close enough, we can say, well, that's kind of, that's a, that's a point off the data manifold. That's that's close enough. So it's the generator is like a byproduct of training this model, but it turns out to be very useful. The question is, did we ever need generative models in the first place? Yes, exactly. So what would it look like if we made an energy based generative model without that kind of adversarial ar architecture? Well, you you have that in uh, autoencoders. They just work like crap, and <laughs> but, have, but why? Why do, you have do, pixel RNNs, <laughs> and they they're pretty much crap. And yeah, I I don't I can't tell you this 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 type of curriculum learning that the Gans are have built in seem to just be doing very well. And what hmm. would happen if we trained a Gan from a self-supervised discriminator? Wow. Like, we, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> like if the discriminator, how, so if the discriminator is taking all the images and then also doing self-supervised learning with it? Yeah. I mean, I don't, don't know what that would look like. I mean, maybe if we had the SIM CLR type setup, so we had a discriminator which was mm -hmm. trained on the, the simple question of do these patches belong in the same image? And then we uh, created a GAN setup from that. Well, I know one paper where they use the auxiliary rotation prediction task in the discriminator. So they actually kind of do test this. I don't know if like, and then, yeah, that'd probably be a good opportunity for a research paper to use the contrastive self-supervised learning for again. But so like what we've been talking about, now, I think it's like, so now the discriminator better knows how to unravel the paper and put the data in a manifold that makes sense. If it has I think there's like two things to multitask learning. It's like it's learning how to better unravel the paper and then but then I don't think the cutting is too useful. I think that's the thing that multitask learning is helping with. Okay. 
Well, I think I I can see what you mean. You you mean you have like a a classifier that can do this this uh, self supervised task really well, and now we want to train a generator to fool this one as much as possible. Yeah. Right? I I think that would go a bit wrong because, and this is my opinion, the image domain is just so prone to adversarial examples that you don't know when to stop the generator. So at one point it will just produce crap. And then there will be a small point where it will produce something that's actually good. And as soon as it passes that, it will start just producing adversarial examples for that particular classifier model. That's why you keep training the discriminator so that all the adversarial examples, it can kind of catch those, right? Every time like the generator produces one, it will be like, nope, 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 nope. <laughs> and if you just keep the discriminator where it is, the generator will just learn to adversarial example the crap out of that discriminator and not produce your true data anymore. That's really interesting. I'm a little bit skeptical about GANs. I, it just seems to me that we don't need them. <laughs> I, I, I have a feeling that in, in a few years time, we'll look back and think, why, why did we even bother doing that? In some sort of margin that you can guarantee. So a lot of classical algorithms can be interpreted in the context of energy-based learning. And here I'm going to talk about a few architectural and regularized methods, particularly regularized methods. So the idea of regularized latent variable method is to regularize the volume of stuff that can take uh, low energy, the volume of Y space uh, that uh, can take low energy. And you do this by regularizing the information capacity of a latent variable. A good example of this is sparse coding. So that's the, the, that's the principle. I'm gonna, so this is uh, sparse coding and, and, kind of, and sparse autoencoders and variational autoencoders interpreted in the context of uh, regularized latent variable methods. So in the context of sparse coding, you linearly reconstruct a vector by uh, finding a, a vector, uh, a latent vector that is sparse, kind of minimizes a particular regularizer here, the L1 norm. And then you can train the decoder to uh, maximally reconstruct a training samples. The thing is, because the capacity of the latent variable is limited, there's only a limited volume of Y space that the system can exactly or properly reconstruct. And so automatically, when you make the energy low at certain points, it becomes high outside. So this is interesting because he said earlier that these architectural methods, the, the ones that, that try to compress the uh, representation are essentially shrink wrapping the manifold. So he then said that by bringing the values down around the manifold, it has the effect of pushing the others up. Yeah, that that makes makes sense. It's I mean, it's, it is a fancy way of saying you should just limit the capacity of your model and regularize it. And that's what we usually say when we regularize models or when we build things into it. Of course, the danger is if you build the wrong restrictions and the wrong regularizers and you make things worse because you're going to predetermine that the energy is high in a place where it actually should be low. Similarly for regularized autoencoders, so regularized autoencoders are autoencoders where, the, again, the information capacity of the latent code is limited, either through sparsity or something similar, or by adding noise to it. So the, the, the idea of variational autoencoders is just to add noise to the, to the code and to limit the amplitude of the codes so that the information capacity overall of the code is, is limited. And you can interpret them as a latent variable energy-based model in which you uh, approximately sample the latent variable to approximately integrate or marginalize over the latent variable through sampling. So those techniques work very well with simple decoders. And uh, I think the big uh, challenge in the next few years is to try to make them work with sort of deep representations as well. Now, there are other types of regularization that lead to kind of good representations, in particular, uh, things that exploit a graph of similarity or perhaps a, a temporal continuity. So things like learning temporally invariant uh, representations or making them linearly predictable. Uh, this is work by uh, my student Roscoe Roshin a few years ago, or by minimizing the, the curvature of the trajectory followed in the representation space. Uh, this is work by Olivier Naff. Yeah, I think this this is the obligatory slide where you push uh, work either that you like or want to promote or sometimes your own work when you give talks like this. So at the end, you should come to something where it's like, look, uh, we've our group has done 
these uh, things as well. Even even though it's just like it seems like one tiny tiny bit picked out of what's possible. And ultimately, he's just coming back to saying we're going to encode what we know about a problem into the architecture. In an autoencoder, that's the fact that we think the data point contains less information than the pixel space. So we're, we're, we're like at a 360 to what we knew at the beginning. <laughs> this works really well. It learns really beautiful features. It's not clear that those features are useful in sort of a deep uh, convolutional net context yet. So we can use conditional versions of those uh, systems to do video prediction and perhaps get machines to learn some structure about the world. So a good example of this is some work that we published at iClear a couple of years ago, which consists in learning one of those variational autoencoders or regularized autoencoder, conditional autoencoder type architecture to predict what cars around you are going to do. So to be able to learn a policy for driving, it's good to be able to predict what cars around you are going to do. And of course, it's not deterministic, so you have to have a latent variable model so that you can vary the latent variable to make multiple predictions. I love the fact that it's it's a probability distribution here. Uh, it's PZ. Uh, this system used a combination of variational autoencoder type uh, sampling as well as another regularization that uh, is basically equivalent to global dropout. So half the time we tell the system your latent variable is zero, make the best the make the best uh, prediction possible. So these are the result. You get blurry predictions if you don't use a latent variable. But you get much better prediction shown on the right here. By sampling the latent variable with different values, you get sort of realistic predictions that are all very different. On the left here is the recorded video. Um, wow. Yes, so this this is, I think, an interesting point just for, for these types of models where if you say, please model, make the single, I'm going to train you to make the single best prediction, which is sort of the average of all the data samples that I have, it's going to just make a blurry mess because what you should act, what it should actually do is say, well, there are two possibilities to continue here. And that's what you capture with this, this latent variable. So you have two training samples maybe, and in one training sample, the car goes here, and in one training sample, the car goes here. And you want to let the model infer that there is a latent variable that is different in the two situations and that actually both are okay. We are using this, in fact, to train a forward model of the world. So. The, the, the trick here is to have a way of predicting what the world is going to do that you can use in the context of a model predictive control uh, system. This is not reinforcement learning because everything is differentiable, including the objective function, the cost. So we estimate the state of the world, run our forward model. This is not the real world. This is our model. It's differentiable. It's a neural net. And for each new state, we give it a proposal action and we sample the latent variable not represented here. We can compute the cost. And through backprop, we can train a policy network to learn to generate an opti optimal sequence of action that will minimize the overall cost over an entire trajectory. Well, he okay, just so described you know. the recurrent <laughs> neural network. That's what I was thinking. <laughs> I mean, this is, yes. Yeah, it's, this is an RNN. Yeah, I, I get the impression that Jan isn't a fan of reinforcement learning. <laughs> it's a cherry on top. Don't you know that? <laughs> So this is uh, very similar to uh, model predictive control, except that we don't infer uh, a sequence of uh, actions. We train a policy network to produce the action from, from the state. And having the ability to kind of generate multiple futures is absolutely essential. So this system can be trained to drive cars with some level of reliability. So this is an example. The blue car here is driven by your agent. Uh, it's actually invisible to the other cars, so it has to avoid getting squeezed. And the white dot indicates the, the control uh, on the car, acceleration, braking, and rotation. Yeah, I think the, the, the point here, what, what, what he's trying to say is that basically the, the, what, what is learned now isn't reinforced. It's, it's an energy function that is basically low whenever the, the trajectory of the car is good. So whenever the, the trajectory of what it predicts the cars will do will be low, and that energy function has multiple minima. Right. So it, it has multiple continuations for the same situations. And really much like an RNN, I can sample from that RNN and that gives me multiple basically continuations of the sentence that I start with. And um, I think the, the connection 
maybe the connection is a bit missing to for him to now really make to the energy function at the beginning where he says look the energy function here has multiple minima and we want to basically explore those in the future but how would you contrast that method to reinforcement learning i mean for for example um is it planning does it know that it would be breaking the rules of the road if it took certain actions? No, it's just going, in this case, I think it's just going via the, the energy function. So it, 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 simply, it simply takes a, it looks at the energy function and it asks, where is the energy function low? And it sees, ah, at this point and at this point, that corresponds to the car going left or right, uh, but not the car being in both places or in the middle of the road or something like this. So there the energy would be low. But would it be you, would it be short sighted in a way that a reinforcement learning algorithm wouldn't be? I think it will have it will have the same problems. It's just a, a different way of of training it and different way of looking at it. Basically they're training an RNN of the world, whereas a reinforcement learning algorithm would train just just a a policy function to to minimize some reward at the end. Ultimately, probably not too much of a different thing. But so what do you think about these world models? Do you think model-based reinforced learning is more powerful than model-free? In terms of RL, it's a good question. Well, is, the, is, is reinforcement learning with a learned model model-based? Well, that's a philosophical question. Because <laughs> well, who knows? <laughs> the point is always you don't have an explicit model of the world, right? Neither does Jan Lacan here. But what he does is basically he learns an RNN where he says, oh, it's it, even the loss function is differentiable. And if he does it via reinforcement learning, it would actually learn how to drive the car by trial and error. And here they learn a model of the world. But yeah, who knows? Okay, con conclusions and conjectures. Self-supervised learning is learning dependencies, as I just said. There's a take-home message. Reasoning through a vector representation and energy minimization might be a way to make reasoning compatible with deep learning and with energy-based uh, learning. Uh, the main obstacle is dealing with uncertainty in high-dimensional continuous spaces. This is not a problem with NLP and BERT because we can discretize uh, the space. The space of words is, is discrete, but it is a problem in uh, high-dimensional continuous spaces like video. So. Predicting points is, is insufficient. Predicting a distribution is intractable. So we have to resort to energy-based models. These are weaker than distributions. And we have two options to train those, contrastive methods and regularized latent variable methods. My money is on regularized latent variable energy-based models. I think those eventually will overtake all the other methods. This is not the case at the moment, though. Could energy-based self-supervised learning be the basis for common sense? This is our best bet at the moment, possibly. Animals and humans learn largely uh, self-supervised, and scaling up supervised learning and reinforcement learning will not take us to human-level AI. And by the way, there is no such thing as artificial general intelligence. Intelligence is specialized, including human intelligence. It's very specialized. And so I think it makes more sense to talk about rat-level, cat-level, or human-level intelligence rather than AGI. Okay, I think we'll start with the low-hanging fruit. I mean, I completely agree with him that there is no such thing as AGI. This is the Francois Chalet worldview you know that that intelligence is is specialized and it's an expression of of, of the environment and and how us as agents interact with our environment well contrary to that the psychology literature tells us pretty much that at least something like iq is just your ability to solve arbitrary tasks so if you can pretty much throw arbitrary cognitive tasks at someone and their iq would pretty much predict with a reasonable correlation how well they would do at it. So maybe there is such a thing. Or we just, we're just so biased in coming up with cognitive tasks. Maybe the intelligence is just the ability to solve problems, the ability to solve cognitive, logical problems. And I'm, I'm putting that, my reasoning behind it is when we determine IQ, we don't need to have that particular set of IQ tasks. 
we know that we can make an IQ test from pretty much any collection of cognitive tasks. It doesn't matter which ones they are. It is remarkably consistent across any sort of cognitive task. So maybe there is such a thing as general intelligence, and it is just the ability to solve logical cognitive reasoning tasks. I suppose so, but any tasks that we place in an IQ test would be playing on similar tasks that we've learned before. True, that that was my counter argument before, is that we are just so biased in coming up with tasks that uh, we're fooling ourselves by saying that there's only one kind of intelligence. <laughs> But yeah, it's I mean it's it's a, it's also a bit of an empty statement to say there's no such thing as AGI and okay. okay. <laughs> when we look back to the uh, the poet paper from Uber, that's the uh, the equivalent of the simple manifold picture. It shows you what intelligence looks like in a very simplified contrived example. And in that world, it, it, what does it even mean to be intelligent? The bipedal walking robot can only do a few things. It can just walk and it can move around. And in a sense, we are like the bipedal robots in the Earth world. If you are aliens looking down on us, we must seem incredibly constrained in all the ways that we can interact with our environment. Sure, but, but any general intelligence we build will also be in that world, right? So, so the, if, if, if they're saying that there's no general intelligence because it could not generalize to other worlds, then fine, I agree. But <laughs> in this world right here, maybe there is such a thing because it's going to live in the same world as we do. That's true. I mean, it, we don't want it more general than that. As a point of clarification, I think I was talking about the intelligence explosion and you're just talking about artificial general intelligence. So you're yep. just talking about an artificial intelligence that could potentially have a task adaptation to the unknown unknowns. Yeah. Okay. So what I find particularly interesting here is the reasoning through vector representation and energy minimization. What do you think of that? What do you think that even means? I was thinking <laughs> that as well. I have no idea what that means. Uh, because, so, um, well, at, yeah, I guess it's interesting to think about like the vector, how we constrain these vectors too. Like you can either have like, they can either be dimensionality and they can take on a certain range of values I guess it's about searching through the vectors then. You know? Yeah, 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 exactly, right? So what, what bugged me in this talk is um, it might be not so easy to go back to the beginning, but maybe you can click the little arrows or something. Where at the beginning, if you click the big arrows on the right, can, is there like a way to go back? Or At some point, he says, inference is done through optimization. Oh, yes, the energy is used for inference, not for learning, uh, which... Basically means if I have an energy function of something, I could find a data point that is compatible with the energy function by minimizing that energy function, which I could do through something like gradient descent, right? But no model in this entire talk does this actively at inference time. So even though, again, the generator learns to minimize the energy function during training, when it produces a sample, it doesn't actually optimize the energy function. It simply produces the sample, right? And and all of these all of these models, they are none of them that he said were actively reducing the energy function at inference. And maybe yeah. this reasoning through vector representations and energy minimization is an allusion to the fact that if we had an energy function that tell us what are logical things, right? Imagine you have a classifier of what what are what statements are logical and what statements are illogical. I could now construct a mathematical proof simply by starting with a bunch of symbols and then SGD minimizing to make that energy function lower and lower. And what I would end up with is a logical statement. And if I now translate this to some sort of embedding space where it's continuous, I could actually do this, right? I could end up with a fully logical statement because I have the energy function that tells me uh, where to go. And I, I think that that was just kind of missing in this talk, this this notion of inference time, uh, energy minimization. It, it really confused mm -hmm. me as well, because it, is it saying that the energy function is not used 
as part of the training process because it is again it's it, yeah it defi- it, what 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 it, it always comes by what do you put into the energy function is the model part of it or is it not right right it's like if i was taking my generator and then i'm trying to like now search along those Z inputs to get the most realistic output. And now how do I do that? So in that case, is the Z differentiable? So I'm trying to maximize the realism of my generator output and I'm trying to search for the Z. Is that differentiable? I think it's the F which must be differentiable. Can I do the derivative of the loss with respect to the Z? Yeah, sure. You can find you can find the best Z to either you know minimize whatever the loss is, and you of course you'll have to pit this against a real data sample. So you can essentially find the Z that will most accurately reconstruct that particular data point. You can hmm. do that, but it's it's not the meaning of a GAN, right? Um, I'm, right. I'm more looking for something where where you actively do what he said at the beginning you should set out to do. So he says that energy-based models are weaker than distributions, but they're a necessary evil because it's just intractable to to use distributions. So making a single point prediction is not good enough, but outputting a distribution is not tractable. I think he contrasts with these two things. And with the car example, you could see this very well. If you just allowed to make a single prediction where the car is going to be in two seconds and you know it could go left or right you'll put it in the middle right because that's the the kind of average of all the futures but you can't that's very bad but also distribution is not very good because you consider every possible thing and now the energy function you can simply say well it's low here and here and higher in between. Isn't it still intractable though? Because the energy function, you would still need to enumerate all of the possible X's and Y's. Yeah, as long as you can start closely enough to the to the actual valley, it's fine. Right? That's exactly the problem with the generator from before. As long as, as you're close enough, <laughs> you're good. But if you yeah. go too far out, the energy function is Part of me is still just thinking, what the, what the hell is he talking about? There's the latent variable thing, fine, but just forget about that for a second. Isn't it just exactly the same as neural networks now? We have a prediction function, which is basically the energy function, and you can explore the space of X and Y now. What's the difference? Yeah. <laughs> well, Is it basically just a whole, just nothing? He's saying nothing. As we said at the beginning, right? This is a descriptive talk. This isn't this isn't introducing any new concept. This is him describing and summarizing existing methods. And you can frame pretty much anything into these energy-based methods. I think the stronger claim that he makes is that there is a sweet spot of of these. There and the sweet spot isn't with the supervised learning, you could frame that as energy-based, or with the probabilistic method, which you could also phrase as energy-based, but there is a sweet spot in between. And I think he says that is the the self-supervised regime. Uh, I think that's the the main claim here. And again, it is a descriptive talk. It is really, we know nothing more. We just know a formulation of what we already have. Yeah. I would understand if the energy-based paradigm gave a theoretical framework with guarantees and bounds and if it was adding significant value to the theoretical understanding of deep learning. It's definitely a nice intuitive way of describing models, especially compositional models. I I like that. I I think explained in these terms, people would understand GANs, for example, much quicker than they would do if you explained it, it directly. But I'm being skeptical here, and I'm I'm hoping you'll play devil's advocate and defend the energy-based models paradigm. Well, I'm not I'm not sure that just from the energy-based models we can we can gain a, a lot. I think it is really the what he says the self-supervised. Yeah, I don't because energy it's just so huge, right? 
I think the things he says around it are much more important. Interesting. So on the basis of our conversation today, do you think the listeners of Machine Learning Street Talk should learn more about energy-based models or do you think that they've already learned more than they need to know? Well, if they understand that it is simply a way of describing many current methods, then I think you know enough. <laughs> maybe, you know, if if you hear this, maybe you'll see connections between things that you didn't see before, like, oh, wait a minute, what's the, what's the actual difference between a K-means and a Gaussian mixture model? Oh, yes, one is normalized, but both are energy-based. Oh, what's the difference between the a language model and just the discriminative thing? Oh, yes, one is one one deals with a probability, one deals with an energy. What's the difference between supervised and self-supervised? Oh, one is maybe reconstructive and the other one is just discriminative. But there's a connection, there's a connection between any of that. Yeah. Okay, well, I mean, this has been a marathon. <laughs> it's it's been two hours and forty five minutes. Without going full Joe Rogan, I think we sh we should edit this a little bit. Yeah. But Connor, do you have any passing or, or, or final comments? Well, I agree that it never really became super clear to me what exactly is an energy-based model. I get there's this like scalar score of similarity between variables, and we get to search through these like latent variables to optimize the scalar activation of the energy function. And that's interesting, although it's still not clear to me why this scalar value is so different than having like uh, some over, you know, having an exact probability assigned to it, you know, like having say like this is five compared to 11 percent, I guess. And then this other thing is 30 percent. So that whole difference to me is maybe not quite clear, but I, I definitely think, you know, it's a really interesting unification of these ideas. And also just like this really helped my understanding of like, these latent variable models and unifying like the variational autoencoder and the generative adversarial network and how you use these latent variables to do multimodal predictions. I'm really interested in the chart of like, the cognitive development. And I think that there, you know, I think it's there's more to it than just self-supervised learning. I think that also, you know, as we talked about like, inductive priors, what knowledge is kind of built into the kid. I think that plays a huge role. What Jan Lacan wants to say is not what he focuses on the most. I think what, what he means to say is something like there is a lot of information in the data itself that we can make use of using these self-supervised tasks and objectives. And we can unify all of those using this energy-based formulation. Even though energy-based models encompass every possible thing you can think of. And I, I think he just wants to show that all these different tasks people come up with, masked language modeling, next sentence prediction, denoising autoencoder, they're just variations on the same theme, which is that we are just trying to get to a function where that is happy when something looks like data and that is not happy when something doesn't look like data. If you can maybe think outside the box in this framework maybe you'll hit the next big thing towards agi which totally exists <laughs> <laughs> okay on that bombshell we'll see you next week folks i hope you've stayed with us all this time see you later. thank you